news, insights and advice from industry experts, keeping you connected in the legal community. Good afternoon everyone and welcome along to episode 8 of In Discussion with De Novo where we are connecting the legal community with interviews, insights and advice from industry experts. I'm here today as always with my colleague Stephen Hill, Ops Director at De Novo and some very, very special guests today. We have Holly O'Hara from Jones White and Caitlin O'Hare from Levy and McRae. So we're really looking forward to having a conversation with you guys this afternoon. So just before we do that, I'll just run through the agenda. So we will give a bit of an overview of our guests. We'll go straight into the discussion. We'll have our Q&A as normal. Um, and then we'll talk about future episodes, get in touch and how to watch again. So what I'll do, just before that, is just give you a bit of background about our guest, Holly, who is a trainee at Jones White, grew up and completed secondary education. Um, and Holly, can you um, <laughs> can, can you can you do this bit for me? Baccalaureate. <laughs> Baccalaureate, perfect. <That's> <laughs> Baccalaureate, perfect. In in Spain, uh, Holly moved to Scotland to complete. Um, uh, her LLB and diploma at the University of Strathclyde. She's worked in large and small firms in Spain, Scotland and Gibraltar, so well travelled. Currently in her second year of traineeship at Jones White, doing a hybrid of family dispute resolution and commercial litigation. A real keen interest uh, is in business development side of lo uh, law firms. So she's involved in the likes of developing uh, the pricing policy at Jones White and different strategies. Caitlin moved to Scotland from Northern Ireland to pursue her career in law. Um, she studied uh, her diploma at Strathclyde also. And Caitlin is currently doing her trainee traineeship with Levy and Cray. Um, and she's in the general litigation team at the moment. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking to both Holly and Caitlin about the challenges of being a trainee sister during lockdown. Uh, Holly and Caitlin have just commenced their second year of their traineeship with uh, their respective firms. And like many of us, they've been working remotely for the past few months and they're keen to give all of you some insight into the challenges they've faced in addition to the positives that have emerged during this time, we'll discuss what's driving Holly and Caitlin to become solicitors, the competitive nature of completing the diploma in professional legal practice to gain their traineeship and how they got to where they are today. They'll also pull back the curtain on what it's like, or really like to be a trainee with mm -hmm. a, a focus on the support needed to succeed, how firms embrace the views of them, the next generation, and the input they have in the decision-making process. And moreover, we'll have we'll finish with a conversation about the short, medium, medium and long-term effects that COVID-19 is having on trainees. So Holly and Caitlin, thank you very much for joining us. No, thank, thank you, you for having us. <laughs> yeah, it's great, it's great. So for, first webinars, I believe. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Personally. Yeah, never Please. done this before. You're yeah. making us sound very mysterious. You know, pull back the curtain. <laughs> I don't know. Here we, we are, really two are. trainees. <laughs> you see, we're to we really find out what it's like, you know. Oh. Um, so, yeah, we'll hopefully do that throughout. But, um, no, you, you guys are working with some great firms. So, yeah, really interested to hear a bit more from you. And throughout, as normal, for anyone that's listening, please feel free to, to type in your questions uh, for Holly and Caitlin. Um, they've assured me they're more than happy to answer anything <laughs> that gets thrown at them. I wonder if any of the bosses are on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so right, guys, if you're if you're happy, I'm, I'm just going to jump in to to the questions. And I think the first one is is relatively straightforward, or maybe. Can you give our listeners some? more background into why you both chose a career in law. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Holly, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll go. 
Um, so well, I can't really pinpoint that sort of light bulb moment when I decided that I wanted to study law. Um, I think I do have one vague memory of fourth year of high school having to do a project. Um, it was like a, a case study and it involved a refugee's human rights and how these had been infringed. And I remember at the time finding that so interesting, seeing for the first time the different levels of legislation at work. So the jurisdictional legislation in the EU um, laws that were at play. So during that project, that was sort of my first experience of the law and it was sort of the first time I saw how law exists and for what purpose or purposes. Um, at school, I was, I was definitely more drawn to social sciences and I, joy, I enjoyed history and economics and philosophy was definitely my favourite subject. So you remember that I obviously had my education in Spain and their education system is very different to the, the Scottish one. In Spain, you complete four years of mandatory high school and those that wish to continue their education do two years of Spanish baccalaureate. <laughs> um, and at baccalaureate, you do have to take a fair number of subjects. For the two years, I had around 12 subjects each year, all with regular exams. Um, right. And those subjects that I chose anyway included you know, history, which was Spanish history, world history, um, economics, philosophy, history of art, etc. So all of my favourite subjects spoke of or involved, involved law in some way, mm -hmm. even if very remotely. So I think throughout my whole education, I knew in the back of my mind somewhere that I wanted to see law in action. Mm -hmm. And by the time it came to applying to university, it was inevitable that I would choose law as a degree. Um, then the big decision was whether I wanted to stay in Spain or move back to Scotland and unfortunately I couldn't base my decision on the weather <laughs> so at the time the the best choice for me was to, to come back to Scotland um, and that's where I studied the LLB. Yeah. For me it's every time I get asked this question you always I think to myself right now you know you should really have a really good answer for why you study law you should really prepare that but no, for, really it was just whenever I was in secondary school it became clear I wanted to have a type of career that was like advocacy and acting that kind of thing I really liked theatre reading mooting law seemed it had all of that from watching tv so um I had this lovely idea of fighting someone's corner for them and that's what I wanted to do as I got older I realized like how important and commendable the work is that lawyers actually do and whenever I see Whenever I see prominent cases on the news, I always think, look, I'm really lucky to be in this career. I really hope, hope I'm involved in some really good cases myself. Yeah, we, we, we've been saying a lot recently that, you know, that sometimes lawyers can get a bad rap for, you know, numerous reasons. But, you know, what we are, we're really trying to push out is, is the message of the, the incredible work that, that lawyers do. And mm -hmm. I think when you hear stories like 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 the ones you've just told it fills you with a lot of hope because you're ultimately saying like you know we really want to help people and um and that i think especially now yeah. is, is so important mm -hmm. um that, that that message gets out that it that it's really that's what the job is mm -hmm. you know definitely and i think it sometimes um it's the the horrible side of law when unfortunately you know legal services aren't free <laughs> so sometimes I yeah. think that's where solicitors get this bad reputation from um, and you know it isn't fair the reality is that you can't really get anything for free so I think that sometimes um, this whole the thing behind people becoming lawyers and wanting to help other people it, it kind of gets pushed aside when we have to talk about fees so much <laughs> yeah and also like popular culture you know always saying oh the sleazy lawyer and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. all over the news these titles that they use it's just that people put you off they make you think that you're you know you're kind of doing something else than being honest mm -hmm. yeah no ab absolutely so you're now trainees both with well-established firms which is which is great news and so how did you, well, we threw up actually, just before I uh, asked this question, yeah, we threw up just a couple of stats, just here based on kind of gender split and also um, and also the size of firms that, that uh, trainees work in. This is just from the, the Law Society website from the, the past few years. So anybody watching just now can, can have a look. But um, so how did you both become a trainee? And was it difficult to find a firm and then get your traineeship? Caitlin, on you go. 
<laughs> right so yeah like, like yeah applying for a trainee it's a really stressful time like it's no joke you're constantly reminded at university you know and on the diploma many of your year group aren't going to find a traineeship so it kind of like occupies your mind from third year onwards in university and like when I had family and friends ask me oh how are you getting on with law I was always mentioning the difficulties of finding a traineeship then because I was really worried that they were going to expect me to get a traineeship and I was thinking in my head there's a huge chance here I'm not going to get one yeah and then whenever I finished LLB I had a serious think about my prospects. I knew there wasn't going to be that many traineeships out there. And looked at my CV and I was like, I think my CV here is nothing special, to be honest. And I, I thought I had work experience. Like I had law experience from when I was 16. But I guess like so did many other people. And I decided to take a year between my degree and the diploma to improve my CV. And luckily, like that was such a good decision because I turned out doing one of the best things I've ever done, which was a research uh, internship at Harvard in last, you know, two years ago. And I stayed out there for six weeks and it was like, I could not believe it. And I think whenever you take a, a time out like that and you're just open, you're like open to do such random things to build yeah. your CV, then you will apply to anything. You know, you'll just do anything at all. Yeah. And then, yeah, whenever I got back from there, I applied for a job at Levy and McCray just to be a facilities assistant. And because I really wanted to see what it was like inside a litigation firm. And when I was there, I was applying for traineeships, obviously, because everybody knows, like, the applications, they're a real nightmare. Like, you have to push through. You've got to do your best on every single one. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was working at Levy & McRae, I decided that I wanted to do my traineeship there. So, like, I was filling out all these applications for other firms. But my, my heart was definitely set on Levy & McRae, if I'm honest. So it was, like, really yeah. difficult to, like, put it all into applications. But you have to do it. You just need to push. Um, but yeah, in answer to your question, it, it can be so difficult to find a firm to take you on. Uh, if you get work experience in loads of different ones and you can make connections, you can boost your CV. Um, you just need to find out what you want to do and really, really try and stand out if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can agree with you more, Caitlin. I think it's it really is so competitive to get a traineeship, um, especially at the moment. Um, I, I was the same as Caitlin because I knew how hard it was going to be. I just... It, tried my absolute best to get as much as I could on my CV to stand out and I think no one should be shy about doing that you really should try to get as much experience as possible and um, I was luckily luckily I didn't find it too hard to to get a traineeship and I had two traineeship offers with other firms when Jones White offered me the traineeship so I was in a very good position to be able to choose which offer I wanted to take up but the, the previous interviews that I had had for other traineeships were absolutely brutal. And I think <laughs> um, you've probably heard about this as well, Caitlin, that they just put trainees to the worst, <laughs> the, the worst kind of days of their lives. I mean, they go on for hours and then you get callbacks and it's, I mean, it really is quite brutal. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I just tried to make sure that I had a really, really solid CV. Um, I did two summer internships at a large commercial firm in Gibraltar during the summers after my first and second year of uni and I also did a summer placement in a Spanish firm the summer before starting first year and just to get something else on my CV to, before the diploma because I still didn't have any traineeship offers I took a summer job in a small high street firm in Glasgow um, and I just think it's important for people who are going to go, be going into their diploma and that are looking for a traineeship to remember that you know, getting as much experience as possible is great for your CV, but you're also going to learn a lot as well, and you'll be able to take that forward into your traineeship. So yeah. it might sound really obvious, but if you do work experience, you're going to learn things like, you know, what's appropriate workwear, um, you'll very, very quickly learn your place as an intern and as a trainee, believe me, um, and if you're lucky and the placement is quite hands-on, you'll get to experience working with legal software and technology and really get a feel for important things like confidentiality and money laundering and, yeah. and that's everything that you can then boast about in these awful traineeship interviews and hopefully <laughs> hopefully you'll get somewhere i'm i'm hope i'm hoping that greg white isn't forcing <laughs> anybody to wear business wear at home <laughs> no, no 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 <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, right, i've ju just got a, a, cu a couple of points on there so i mean it being brutal that that's i mean that's quite interesting that I suppose with that in mind and it being so challenging, are there, first point, are there enough tools out there to help you through that? And I suppose the likes of the Law Society and 
maybe even bar associations mm -hmm. doing enough to support um, people coming through the diploma to try and get their traineeships? Are they doing enough? And is there a platform anywhere? And the reason I, I ask about this because one of our one of our partners, um, Hey Legal, which which you guys know about, um, they 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 have they recently tweeted out that they were you know looking to try and support trainees and, and actually or support anyone coming through the diploma to try and get a traineeship you know just mm -hmm. as a sort of offer of goodwill and that, that just felt like a really good platform to to try and help and mm -hmm. um, with that does anything like that already exist or is it just a kind of free-for-all just go for it you send out as many cvs as you can mm -hmm. and hope for the best mm -hmm. like holly did you feel like strathclyde were really good on the diploma for like pushing about traineeships um oh gosh i wonder who's listening but uh, no I'm, I'm only kidding but i, I think um <sighs> I think it was good towards the end because they did have, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin, but I think people from the Law Society came in um, and they mm -hmm. spoke about how best to, you know, draft your CV, how you should be sending off your covering letters and things like that. And I think there was obviously the Strathclyde Uni also do a, a law fair every year and that's great to sort of get some yeah. advice from trainees that are there. But I can't really remember feeling very supported but I don't know if that was maybe just me just finding it all very overwhelming and just kind of wanting to do it on my own anyway. Um, it's probably you're also so worried because, you know, yeah. they, they do impress upon you about the seriousness of it and the lack of jobs. So that that's mm -hmm. always on you, I think. Um, yeah. That almost feels slightly counterproductive and as much as I get it, right, and I get that they have to be forceful and I get that it's a competitive market and difficult to get a job, but... I suppose my argument to that would be, well, I, I, I'm a big believer in if you're going to shout about a problem, you should always have at least one solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't like them coming with problems without at least one. And mm -hmm. if that's being, if that's the narrative, and you're being told, right, look, it's difficult to do this, there should be some sort of support network in place to help you through that process. Whether that's lawyers who are working you know, in the industry who, you know, support the students in some way and advise them about all the sort of trials and tribulations that you that you go through to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that makes, it makes sense to me anyway um, that, that something like that would be in place over and above just the, the standard support that you get. Yeah, like we, like we definitely had loads of support in the diploma. You need to actually think about even before the diploma, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you need to consider traineeships a lot earlier on. You need to be yeah, building you up your CV mm -hmm. from like the middle of university. So yeah. it should be constantly on top mm -hmm. of you that you, you need to be thinking about getting a traineeship at the end of this, if that's what you're going to do. Yeah. I don't know about you, Caitlin, but I, I feel like during the LLB, they just, they never spoke about the traineeship as much as they probably should have done. I feel like it was never really important. And I can understand that because there are lots of people that do the LLB with no intention of doing the diploma, with no intention of practicing law. So mm -hmm. I suppose that's probably what it comes into, but I think there should be an earlier discussion from you know year one, year two of the LLB about you know how difficult it is to get a traineeship in, in order to, to kind of prepare you for what's to come. Yeah, like I remember being in uni when they talked, when it might have been second or third year and they talked about it and I just went, Wait, what? What do I have to yeah. do? What, what do you mean? There's yeah, no job. I remember this as well. Yeah, it's just so worrying. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost, it was almost like a bit of a surprise. Like, mm -hmm. not, not a surprise, but you were, sort of right, oh, whoa, right, hold okay. on a minute. Mm -hmm. That's that's going to take a lot of time and effort to kind of get there. I suppose it's worth doing it, but getting it flagged up a bit earlier would be useful, I think. I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so just moving on from there, so you're both young aspiring lawyers and I'm sure you've got lots of amazing ideas and things that you want to do um you know short medium and long term do your the firms that you're that you're working at the moment do they embrace a younger perspective on improving working practices um in, in any way uh, so are your ideas welcome then can you influence decision making or, or change it's sometimes what what we described as reverse mentoring, you know, mm -hmm. the image sort of portraying that, you know, to yeah, introduce the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, is that, is that something that happens? Do you get that opportunity? 
yeah, yeah. I, I would say personally, um, my firm definitely embraces younger perspective overall. Um, and actually, I'm kind of proud to say that they do seek it out. They are active in, in that regard. Um, I think Jones White is a young firm and that it's only really been in operation for coming up seven years. Um, and young in the sense that our partners, and particularly our founding partners, are younger than the partners at your average firm of our size. Um, so I think, from my point of view anyway, this means that trainees find the partners more approachable at Jones White. Um, we are a modern and we are a progressive firm, so I don't believe you can achieve that status of being progressive, being uh, modern by failing to look to younger perspective. Um, as a personal example, as you said at the, the start, uh, Grant, I'm obviously only a couple of weeks into my second year of training now, but since the start of the year, I've been heading up together with um, Ian McNall, who's our operations and strategy director, the new pricing policy for the firm. And this started a wee bit unintentionally, actually, sort of around the summer last year. Um, within our family department, we were making changes in a number of areas, in particular our pricing and how we were carrying this out. And I realized that I actually had some good ideas and I suppose importantly to this question is that they were being listened to and yeah. they were actually being actioned by the partners. Um, so somewhat organically that grew legs and from the start of this year, I have had a lead role in developing our pricing strategy. Um, and actually to my surprise, I, I really do enjoy this. Uh, so yeah, certainly from my point of view, my firm really does actively seek out the younger perspective. That's good. There we go. Brownie points on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> That's Definitely. a great answer. No, it's really exciting that you get that opportunity because it's, uh, all, it's a, a huge part of the firm. You mentioned earlier about how, how important that, you know, there's a lot of focus on, on fee and, and, mm -hmm. and bringing the money to build the business. And ultimately, you know, every firm is selling, you know, mm -hmm. a product and service. Yeah, so mm -hmm. they have the opportunity to, to make that experience better for your clients is is huge yeah yeah no it definitely is I feel I feel really lucky actually that obviously I have the trust of the firm so no it's good it's good to see something different a different side of of law firms anyway yeah and Caitlin well, that's, and that's me now <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, no, yes, yeah, see with Levy and McCray, obviously they're a far older firm and there's partners in them, they're probably the ages, of, they're a wee bit older than maybe the partners in Jones White, but like my experience of Levy and McCray is that if we would have a meeting, say, at the end of the meeting, a managing partner would turn around, he would say, do any of the trainees have an idea on how we might do that part different, or do you think we should maybe do this? Like, they seem very open to um, ideas from younger lawyers in the firm like there's an appetite for that mm -hmm. because like I, I know if I had an idea I could just walk into one of the partners room and say I have an idea for something they'd say yeah like pull up a chair so yeah they definitely they definitely um make us feel that we could come to them if we had an idea excellent no that's really that's really good news it's so it's such a, a po positive outlook to have to to try and bring the business forward because we we've spoke about so so often um about you know the the legal profession sort of being sort of laggards in terms of when it comes to embracing new ideas and, and new technology and and the fact that that the current situation is has broken down barriers to introduce new ways of working the fact that that you have these ideas you're putting them forward being they're being listened to but not only listened to but then implemented is uh, you know hats off to, to to both your firms for doing that it's yeah, you don't be, expect. Yeah, it must be so exciting for other for other trainees to hear that as well. I'm sure there's there's some listening now, and there'll be there'll be lots of listen to the to the recorded version as well. Mm -hmm. That must fill in with a lot of enthusiasm, you know, to to want to participate in a traineeship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. hope so. Yeah, yeah, I think as well. It's um, kind of your luck, the firm that you go to. <laughs> I think. Yeah, so with. with so with modern ideas and it comes modern technology and there's there's a lot of talk about this at the moment and different uh, tools being introduced into into the, the legal profession maybe the, maybe they already existed but they are definitely being utilized more than they have been in the past how important is technology to you and to your firm for 
I suppose, doing your job and for the firm to just operate? Um, I think technology is one of those things right now that if you don't keep up with it, then you're going to just fall behind. And everybody knows that. Like law firms, they are, they're definitely behind in other industries. I think that that's my opinion. Um, for me, technology is very important. You know, it connects everyone around the world. It's boosted every single industry. I know it's important to my firm as well because it, you know, it, it brings advancements in business and this results in, you know, you've got higher productivity, you've got, you raise the standard of work, you can get things done um, better than you did before. And if you look at the current situation, like, you know, with, we all have to work remotely now, like my firm's got all these measures in place that just makes this so seamless. It seems like the work is still going ahead as it was. Um, I know there's firms obviously that didn't have a lot of that in place and they're probably struggling now a wee bit during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I, I say my I obviously think technology is very important. Of course it is. Um, Jones Wright are a, a paper light firm and we do try and do as much as we can remotely and electronically anyway, even in non, you know, normal working from home circumstances. Um I, I can't really take anything away from the partners um, or our operations team for making sure we could all work from home when the lockdown hit. But I think the fact that we are so paper light and that we do so much of our work and rely so heavily on technology meant that we could easily enough transition into this new working from home era. Um, so, you know, of course, being so completely reliant on technology and hoping that the server doesn't crash can be a bit of a threat. Um, but I mean, nothing that the firm hasn't been able to handle in the past. Um, I think what the lockdown is probably solidifying is just how reliant firms are on good, efficient technology. Um, and I think that's probably going to change many working practices going forward. Sure. And just just on that then, so you know, just a bit of a follow-up to that. You mentioned about working from home. Do you see any sort of reality where that becomes normal? Mm. So even when this is even when this is over, I mean, I know it can be difficult, and I know it's it, it can be sometimes easier to be in the office. But do you do you see your firms embracing that going forward? You know, we're always talking about the new normal. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is that something that's been spoken about um, at your firm's just now at all? Um, it's, it's not really been um, spoken at per se within the firm, but kind of what I've been um, seeing and reading and sort of thinking about over the last couple of weeks or month or so is that really I don't think we're going to go back to the way we were before. I think we can all agree on that. And mm -hmm. if you think about it from a, a kind of economical sense, you know, why would you continue to pay such extortionate overheads for an office in the city centre when these three these three months have showed us that we can carry on business as normal but with our staff working from home so mm -hmm. obviously with the exception of you know having to, to attend at court or hearings or or such like I think there will be scope for people to be working more remotely or working from home more than we were previously. Sure. Yeah, like I've thought about it as well, just about how enjoyable it is as well. You get you get a lot done, I think, at home, and it cuts down in a day, like a twelve-hour day, down to an eight-eight-hour. You can get, you know, you can hang about with family and save some money eating at home and whatnot. I just think when you, whenever I think about the future now, I never would have thought in my head, oh, I would when I apply for jobs in the future, will I consider like you know flexibility and remote working and whatnot? And now I think I would, I definitely would, because I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Sorry, there was just a bit of a noise in the background there. Apologies, just trying to no, sort that okay. out. Um, no, it's really interesting. I think that um, I think you're absolutely right that it, it could um, it could potentially happen. So um, time will tell, I suppose, on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so the the pandemic that we're going through just now, it's impacted firms in lots of different ways economically, socially, you know, the list goes on. But how has it impacted you guys? And, and do you think graduates coming through this year will find it tough, well, I suppose after listening to your earlier points, tougher to find a traineeship given everything that's been going on? Um. Well, luckily, I suppose for Caitlin and myself, um, COVID hasn't really 
I, I, I think I could probably speak for you here, Caitlin, but negatively impact is, impacted us in, in regards to our traineeship. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do consider myself very lucky not to have been furloughed um, when the reality is many trainees have been furloughed. Um, and obviously Caitlin and I haven't. Um, obviously working from home in lockdown, I mean, it hasn't been easy. That, I do miss the office sometimes and yeah. you know, when the weather has been nice um, like it has been you know I do I miss the commute into the office I, I miss having a morning coffee with the team silly things like that um, luckily I've I have really good supervisors at the firm both in the family department and in the dispute resolution department and I've never once felt isolated um, or that I'm struggling since the lockdown began. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, kind of going back to technology, everyone is just an instant message or an email away, aren't they? So having regular calls and catch-ups about workloads has helped. Um, I would say that the obvious thing that I have missed is shadowing and attending court. Um, I really Absolutely. miss kind of seeing advocacy in action and I would say that's the biggest um, impact on, on my training um, as it's an essential part of the, the traineeship and the learning process. I, I do think there will be fallout for people coming out of the diploma just now. Um, I think most firms have had to be economical with their decisions since lockdown and business has been slow in some areas of the law. I think um, I read yesterday that actually the recommended rate of pay for trainees will not change this coming year and I think it tends to increase somewhat each year yeah I think that's right isn't it so um the law society have advised that given the impact of covid that the rate is going to remain the same so I think that just mm -hmm. goes to show you just kind of how uncertain it is at the moment for the legal yeah. sector yeah for, for me I, I'm the same as you like I wasn't furloughed luckily wasn't so had something to do during these weeks of being stuck in the house yeah. um and then because you were working then we didn't really have financial worries i've actually saved money which is pretty good um <laughs> that is good going caitlin <laughs> i'm jealous yeah my, my overdraft is going to disappear <laughs> maybe, maybe next month maybe next month um but yeah like staying in your home for weeks on end you're only permitted to leave for essentials some exercise you're unable to see your family you know undoubtedly it's going to take a toll on everybody um i just think the, the scariest thing is the virus like lockdown it might have been eased and whatnot but the virus remains and everyone's always going to be thinking about their vulnerable family members still even mm -hmm. as kind of time goes on yeah. and then if you just add financial instability into the mix here mm -hmm then it's going to be frightening. So loads sure. of graduates are going to be seeking a traineeship and they're going to be really worried, maybe. I think it yeah. will be a difficult time for them. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's important not to lose all hope, though, and think to ourselves that they're not going to get a traineeship because then they're not going to apply to ones and they're not going to have all the enthusiasm they usually would. And if they have to, if they have to extend their diploma, then they have to extend their diploma. Like, it's not the end of the world. You just have to, you just have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think all, all very good points, and I, you know I go back to to you both being I suppose shining the examples of you know of what what can happen when you work hard, um, when you not only in the lead up to but during, and I, I suppose it it goes to show how important you are to the firm and that you've you know I know sometimes it's financial difficulties that will. Um, that will mean people are furloughed, but um, you haven't been, and so you're you're an important part of an uh, important part of those, those businesses, which is just hats off to both of you for for getting through this as well. Because there's a lot of talk as well, and you know the, uh, the lost side have been very vocal about this about well-being as well, and it's it must. I mean, it definitely was for us. You know, as a business, you know, we we we've uh, we we started working from home a week or so earlier. Um, then the lockdown officially officially begun, sort of just preempting what was going to happen. And Stephen, who primarily leads on this, has been very vocal and supportive, and and and, and making sure exactly like like you both said that, you don't, that people don't feel isolated in in this situation. Be that from other people um, or from doing the things that they want to do, that interaction that you're talking about and the shadowing and the going to court and, and being there, you know, that, that can have a significant effect on you because you're sort of going, when is that going to be happen again? Is my traineeship going to be extended? Am I not going to get to where I need to be mm -hmm. in the time frame that I thought? 
Yeah. You're right. You know, we, we have we have to we all understand the situation and we're not trying to push anything through, but it's a general mm. it's a, a genuine sort of concern for it for everyone. And training's yeah. coming through, yeah. I think we need, need to watch this, need to listen to you guys mm-hmm. and really understand that um mm. that what can be achieved. And like you said there, Caitlin, just not to give up. Mm-hmm. 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 Definitely. It, I mean, I don't think it's comparable at all, but there was definitely fallout in the uh, 2008 recession, um, and that was quite significant for the legal sector and for trainees. Um, mm-hmm. I've heard from friends and colleagues who were coming out of the diploma at that time that they struggled to get a traineeship because firms just weren't hiring. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, perhaps we'll see something similar in the wake of, of COVID. We just don't know. So mm-hmm. even for people like Caitlin and myself, you know, it's not just concerning for people coming out of the diploma, but whilst May 2021 looks far away now, you know, that'll come around quite quickly. And who knows mm-hmm. if we'll still be seeing the effects of COVID then. Yeah. We really just don't know. So, yeah, as you say, just try to be as positive as possible about the whole thing. That's all you can do. Absolutely. No, very well said. Um, okay, what I'm going to do now is we've, we've had a couple of questions come in, um, so I'll just pass you over to Stephen, who will put a couple of questions to you, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yep, great. All right, thanks for that. Um, CPD is such an important part of your traineeship, and given the challenges we face, as mentioned, with gathering in public places or venues, how do you see CPD being delivered by the Law Society and Bar Association going forward? Uh, yeah. So I, I think I can definitely uh, see it changing and, and probably moving towards being held remotely or, or certainly being held on more online platforms. Um, I mean, yes, we don't really know what the situation is going to be when we all go back to income as you know, normal, if that's ever going to happen. Um, but I suppose there may be um, scope to have some limited or restrictive um, restricted seminars or lectures or things like that um, in addition to more um, online um, seminars. I mean personally I prefer the online CPD uh, rather than having to go anywhere and do it in person um, but I wouldn't say that I never want to go to a live seminar again because I think you really do make a lot of connections at these things. You meet other people within the the kind of legal sector um, and I don't I think that's invaluable I don't think you can really um, you can't put a price on that getting to know other people within your sector sure yeah like I think when I think of CPD I've, I have had a virtual CPD um like at the beginning of lockdown and it was good but I, I do think that I preferred uh, going somewhere and meeting mm. somebody and just chatting to them and the one that was on the Mac it was on the computer obviously all day and I was also kind of trying to do work at the same time so instead of being like totally switched off, I was like half doing CPD and then also doing my work when instead you could be somewhere and just for a day. Like I like to learn as if I'm in a classroom, like sitting mm. at a desk, got a pen and pencil. So yeah. it's, I guess it just depends. Like I think um, if it was all virtual, I would not like that. But if it was like a mix, then that would be good. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I get almost like a kind of blended approach. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. And, and just to jump in here, Stephen, sorry. Um, because we, we've been talking about this recently um, with, with a few different people and the importance of it, specifically for trainees as well, because, um, you know, you're, you're, it's such a critical time for you and how best to, to deliver yeah. um, the CPD for you. I mean, there's, I, I suppose it's just finding, finding a platform, isn't it, where, where, where all this can live really you know i mentioned mm-hmm. before about hey, hey legal and that that's that's free at the moment and you know mm-hmm. and people are using that as a as a, a vehicle to 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 gather up cpd um but i think for anyone say like the glasgow bar association for example it's about looking at about speaking to people like you mm-hmm. as well you know that's the, you know this is where the feedback comes from this is the, impo- the important part of doing things like this so that there's people out there that can hear your opinion and the way that you want to do it. It's mm-hmm. slightly conflicting opinions almost there as well, because Paul, you're saying, well, actually, I, I'd prefer to be able to do it, I suppose, in my own time, because I think a lot of the time, the argument to CPD is it's long, um, mm-hmm. and it, you know, it could last all day. That's a day where I could be feeing or doing what, you know, doing other work and, and things like that. And, and Caitlin, you quite rightly said that there, even though you did an online 
version. Mm -hmm. It was during the day um, when you could have been working. So you're trying to catch up. Um, so it's trying to get that balance, isn't it, between the right, can I, can I do CPD almost in my own time or at a time that suits me? Uh, and can I, can, can I do part of it online and can I do part of it when I get to network and I get to, to link in with people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, sorry, Stephen, I'll put, sorry, jumping in there. No, no, you're all right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much us for this week. You can reach out to Caitlin and Holly any time to discuss any of the points we discussed today. Or contact yeah. you. Stephen, just what, just, just one more thing. Sorry, I think there was another question that came in. Um, I'll just have a wee look. Not to cut you off. Is about advice. I'm sure I saw someone coming through about advice for mature students. Yeah. It, it, Anyone got hey, Caitlin, do you want to say anything about that? Um, for a mature student. Yeah, so it was Holly, uh, would you have any advice for mature students or career changers? I see there is a good proportion of these groups entering law. Um oh gosh, Caitlin, I defer to you and then I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm trying to I'm trying to That's... imagine just if, imagining if I was that person, what type mm -hmm. of like answer would I want? Well, if I was like a mature student. Mm -hmm. Um, if I was maybe say doing something else and I jumped into law, like what would you do? Well, mm -hmm. maybe I would consider doing, if, if you're talking about studying, the, there's an accelerator course. Maybe I would consider doing that mm -hmm. to, because you, you don't want to waste, for, not you're wasting, oops, mm -hmm. you don't want to do four <laughs> years. Um, so you want to get ahead of that. I think, in my opinion, mature students have, they've got life experience. They've got Absolutely. other jobs. They've mm -hmm. got, they, they're nearly ahead of some of these trainees mm -hmm. because they've got so much to talk about in an interview. So. I think Definitely. it would work out very well for a mature student that's very interested in, in, in law. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't really think um, if you're a mature student and you're considering law, I mean, absolutely go for it. As Caitlin said, I think you're going to have a lot of experience that you're going to be able to bring not only to, you know, the, the traineeship and traineeship interviews, but to the, the LLB. So if you have an undergrad already, um, you can certainly bring skills that you've learned there over to, to the LLB or indeed the accelerated. Um, I wouldn't even worry about, I mean, you're probably not, but you know, if you're a, if you consider yourself to be a mature student and you're worried about what it's going to be for be like for you, I wouldn't have any concerns. I, I think just go for it. I mean, it is difficult. Don't get me wrong. That the LLB is a constant slog, but you know, it's it's satisfying once you get it. Ideal. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks very much for answering those questions. In next week's episode, we'll be discussing with Moira Dini, chief executive of the Glasgow Bar Association. Moira will discuss the challenges she's faced when communicating with the legal community throughout this pandemic and how the GBA has successfully managed to keep information flowing to their members and beyond. Moira is also keen to explore and seek viewers and how we can best communicate in these challenging times and is particularly interested in how trainee solicitors and qualified solicitors see the immediate and future delivery of learning. We want that episode to be as interactive as possible and this is a great opportunity for GBA members and non members to connect with and put questions to someone who is at the co-face of running an association whose purpose is not only to be an independent voice of the legal profession in the west of Scotland but is responsible for promoting, representing and protecting the rights and interests of its members in the practice of the law. That episode will take place at 3.30 on Wednesday the 10th of June. A registration link will be sent out in due course. This episode, as always, has been recorded and will be available to watch on our website in the next 24 hours. The link is there and it will also be sent to you directly once it's ready to view. That's episode eight ended. I'd like to thank Caitlin and Holly for, and everyone listening for joining us this afternoon. And finally, I would just like to say, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. We'll see you next time for more In Discussion with De Novo. Thanks so much, Holly. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye.